There's some nice uh, lie flat beds up front. Um, grab those. <laughs> Don't all have to be cattle class at the back. Come on through. Good day, Derek. Is everyone set to go? We're all good? Great. Hey, well, listen, firstly, uh, kia ora, good morning, everybody. It is great to be here in Invercargill, a fantastic, probably one of the coolest cities in New Zealand. So um, it is great to be here. Uh, and can I just say it is awesome to be able to come and talk to you today uh, at this great facility that was uh, part of SIT and a great investment for SIT uh, to talk about how we're actually going to revive again. Before I begin, can I just acknowledge his worship, uh, Nob Clark, uh, Mayor of Invercargill. Thank you, mate, for all your public service and your leadership. And, advocacy of this region. Can I also acknowledge uh, Shami Abbasing and say thank you for your great work as City of Great South and economic development and what you're doing to, to drive activity down here. We appreciate you. Awesome to see Chris Ramsey, uh, CEO of Invercargill Licensing Trust. And Chris, thanks for everything that you do. Carol Haggerty, uh, who is obviously the campus director here at SIT, and say thank you so much. But I am here with my very good friend, the great MP from Invercargill, Penny Simmons, and I've got to tell you it's uh, because um, you know she has been part of the success of the city uh, over the last few years, and her role as uh, CE of SIT, without doubt, the most successful polytechnic we had in this country, uh, and the great work that she did as CEO of 18 years uh, was really fantastic. And Penny, it's awesome to come to Invercargill. You know, I love this city. I've been here many times at a personal level on holiday, but also um, uh, visiting you in many in, in our past lives uh, and in our recent lives as well. And I just know the contribution that you've made to the city is awesome. So uh, great to have you here as our vocational education spokesperson as well. And then to be here with my very good friend, Erica Stanford, uh, who's come down from Auckland to be with us today uh, as our education and immigration spokesperson as well. So awesome to have you here uh, with us today. As I keep saying, you know, when you boil away, take away all the noise of this election campaign, it all boils down to the economy. Uh, and that's what this is all about. Because on October the 14th, Kiwis are going to get to choose who they think is going to be the better economic managers of this great country of ours. And we talk about the economy a lot because actually that's actually what it's all about. That's actually how we get to build the infrastructure and deliver the public services that we think are so important uh, for us to have in this country. Whenever I talk about the economy, it's not just about the numbers, it's always about people because that's what it's about. It's about jobs, it's about opportunities, it's about incomes, it's about saving, it's about spending, it's about borrowing. It's the big and small decisions that all of us make as individuals, as families, as businesses, and indeed the decisions of government uh, makes a big part of it, obviously, as well. But it's a, we talk about the economy because it's a strong economy that enables us to pay for more of the things that New Zealanders want and need and we expect the government to provide. But to have more, we have to earn more. That's the deal. And so last week we saw what Treasury confirmed uh, for most of us, which is that New Zealand is in a really dire economic set of circumstances economically. We see Treasury forecasts that are saying we will have slow and anemic growth and big economic slowdown over the next few years. We see high inflation and high interest rates carrying on for longer, sustaining and extending the cost of living crisis that causes so much pain and suffering to New Zealanders up and down our great country. And most worryingly at all, we've had a government that has spent more, it has taxed more, but worryingly it has borrowed more. And borrowing has gone from $5 billion worth of debt in 2019 to now $100 billion worth of debt. And the problem with that is we will now spend $11 billion servicing that debt and that, when you think about it, is more than what we spend funding primary and secondary schools across New Zealand. So the reality is uh, this is a government that has presided over huge amounts of economic mismanagement. It didn't have to be this way, uh, but it is, and a national government will come in and clean it up as we always do. Now the problem, as I keep saying, is that in order for us to sort our economy out, we have to get ourselves into a growth mindset because the last six years we have been very inward, very insular uh, looking as a country and we now need to step up and actually grow this country and we can do that incredibly positively. We have awesome Kiwi services and products to sell to the world. We sit bang smack in the middle of the Asia Pacific region, the most dynamic part of the globe, and we have people that are demanding our services. But we have to go out now and hustle and make things happen and that means every sector across this country needs to do its part and play its role. 
Uh, as you all know, before the pandemic, uh, international education was New Zealand's fifth largest export earner. It generated almost $4 billion worth of uh, value to the economy and it employed 6,000 people, and by some estimates much higher. And, in some, and as you all know, uh, our country was so slow coming out of the pandemic and we didn't bounce back as quickly as places like Canada and Australia. And so we actually want to see now uh, this sector take off because just last year it generated only $800 million worth of GDP to New Zealand. And while those numbers are picking up, we are well behind where our competitors are. And be under no illusion, I use that word competitors deliberately, think Australia, think Canada, who are out there in the world hustling, making the case for why students should be coming to their countries. We see Canada pretty much where they were pre-COVID, Australia pretty close to it. And if you look at the numbers that we've seen in New Zealand, we're less than halfway where we were uh, before COVID came along. So it is critical that we get our sectors growing. Uh, we have to get ourselves externally oriented. We have to get ourselves focused on going out in the world with some positivity, some confidence, some ambition and some aspiration. Let's leave the negativity and the inwardness and the insularity behind. And let's go out there and make a great future for ourselves. And part of that is firing up every sector we have in this economy to earn more so we grow our economy, so we can invest in infrastructure, we can invest it back in enhancing our public services like education and health. Uh, with that, it's also vital that our tertiary institutions can actually turn back on international students uh, so that they can actually get supported through that process as well. But importantly, we get our, our sector of our economy growing. With that, I just want to uh, hand over to Penny, who will talk us through uh, our plan to actually revive uh, uh, international education, and then on to Erica, and then I'll come back, close it out, and then we'll have a bit of a mix and mingle, and then what we'll do at the end is, uh, we'll have it after that, we'll then go deal, with, talk with the media, and do a media briefing after that. Uh, Penny. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher, and it's wonderful to have you here in Southland, and particularly fabulous to have you here at SIT. Awesome. And it's great to be in amongst colleagues and friends from SIT. So the revenue raised from higher international fees supports New Zealand's universities, our polytechnics and other tertiary institutions to provide better quality education and services for all our students while keeping costs down for our domestic students. It helps great institutions like our wonderful SIT deliver the sort of world-class education that drives growth and opportunity both here in Southland and in the rest of the country. International education, as you know, also strengthens our connections with the rest of the world, which makes it easier for New Zealanders to succeed on the global stage, exposing our young people to new ideas and perspectives and creating international networks that can drive future economic growth and opportunity back home. So it's absolutely vital we get international education back on its feet. Other countries have got the jump on us recently, post-COVID. They've adjusted their immigration settings to attract international students while we are struggling to keep up. We need to take action to encourage students to choose New Zealand as their preferred place to study. I'm really pleased now to ask my good friend and colleague Erica to talk about the specific changes to immigration that will help revive, revive international education in New Zealand. Thanks, Erica. Kia ora, good morning everyone. Thank you Penny and Christopher. Uh, National has said that we will make immigration meet New Zealand's needs. And as Penny and Christopher have outlined, there is a need to revive international education as part of lifting economic growth in New Zealand. This is a very competitive sector, uh, as Christopher and Penny alluded to. And New Zealand needs faster processing for our student visas because academic courses have fixed dates and students need certainty. Yeah. And we need a more competitive offering when it comes to work rights for students, but also for their partners. We can also be smarter about how we lift the education sector. So our policy has a particular focus on attracting students who we want to study in areas where New Zealand has particular skills shortages. That's because it's far better to fill those shortages with someone who has lived here, who's studied in New Zealand already, rather than bringing in workers from overseas who don't have that same connection to this country. Mm. So our plan has four points, which are one, fast-tracking visa processing for international students who pay an additional fee. Uh, two, 
Increasing from 20 to 24, the number of hours international students are able to work each week. And now that very much brings us in line with Australia. When Christopher talked about being competitive, that's what we're talking about here, making sure that students choose New Zealand because they have the same work rights as they do in Australia. Three, expanding work rights for international students and their partners. Uh, for example, we would give partners of students studying degree level seven qualification and above open work rights while their partner is studying, returning to what we used to do. As part of expanding work rights, we would also ensure international students who have studied in New Zealand in areas where we have skills shortages have a pathway to residence. If they're here and they're studying in an area where we need them to be, we would love them to be able to stay and work uh, in that area. Four, we will diversify the countries from which Education New Zealand recruits. A recent report said New Zealand was in the bottom three nations for the diversity of our international student population, with 80% of students coming from just nine countries in 2022. So that's a, a quick summary of our proposed changes, which we believe will make New Zealand a more attractive destination for international students and be part of reviving the sector here and contributing to economic growth, which is good for all of us. Awesome. Well, listen, can I just um, say thank, thank you to Penny, thank you to Erica. Um, um, I hope you got a sense of it. You know, we have a great country here in New Zealand. We have so much potential. We have incredible people. We sit in a dynamic part of the region and we have a great so set of social institutions here that puts fairness at the heart of everything we do. Uh, but we are not realising that potential. We are not solving our problems and we are not maximising the opportunities that are in front of us. We have a great opportunity here to actually revive our international student sector, to make sure that we can get really great connections to the world, get those people-to-people -people connections flowing, to create opportunities uh, in our own economy, to actually get it growing again, uh, and we're really excited about that. So um, with that, um, let's break. We'll get a chance to catch up with a few of you, uh, and then we'll take our questions from the media uh, separately after we've done that. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Appreciate it. Haggerty, uh, who is obviously the campus director here at SIT, and say thank you so much. But I am here with my very good friend, the great MP from the Cargill, Penny Simmons, and I've got to tell you it's uh, because um, you know she has been part of the success of the city uh, over the last few years, and her role as uh, CE of SIT, without doubt the most successful polytechnic we had in this country. Uh, and the great work that she did as CEO of 18 years uh, was really fantastic. And Penny, it's awesome to come to Invercargill. You know I love this city. I've been here many times at a personal level on holiday, but also um, uh, visiting you in, many, in, in our past lives uh, and in our recent lives as well. And I just know the contribution that you've made to the city is awesome. So uh, great to have you here as our vocational education spokesperson as well. And then to be here with my very good friend, Erica Stanford, uh, who's come down from Auckland to be with us today uh, as our education and immigration spokesperson as well. So awesome to have you here uh, with us today. As I keep saying, you know, when you boil away, take away all the noise of this election campaign, it all boils down to the economy. Uh, and that's what this is all about. Because on October the 14th, Kiwis are going to get to choose who they think is going to be the better economic managers of this great country of ours. And we talk about the economy a lot because actually that's actually what it's all about. That's actually how we get to build the infrastructure and deliver the public services that we think are so important uh, for us to have in this country. Whenever I talk about the economy, it's not just about the numbers, it's always about people because that's what it's about. It's about jobs, it's about opportunities, it's about incomes, it's about saving, it's about spending, it's about borrowing. It's the big and small decisions that all of us make as individuals, as families, as businesses, and indeed the decisions of government uh, makes a big part of it, obviously, as well. But it's a, we talk about the economy because it's a strong economy that enables us to pay for more of the things that New Zealanders want and need, and we expect the government to provide. But to have more, we have to earn more. That's the deal. And so last week we saw what Treasury confirmed uh, for most of us, which is that New Zealand is in a really dire economic set of circumstances economically. We see Treasury forecasts that are saying we will have slow and anemic growth and big economic slowdown over the next few years. We see high inflation and high interest rates carrying on for longer, sustaining and extending the cost of living crisis that causes so much pain and suffering to New Zealanders up and down our great country. And most worryingly at all, we've had a government that has spent more, it has taxed more, but worryingly it has borrowed more. And borrowing has gone from $5 billion worth of debt in 2019 to now $100 billion worth of debt. 
And the problem with that is we will now spend $11 billion servicing that debt, and that, when you think about it, is more than what we spend funding primary and secondary schools across New Zealand. So the reality is uh, this is a government that has presided over huge amounts of economic mismanagement. It didn't have to be this way, uh, but it is, and a national government will come in and clean it up, as we always do. Now, the problem, as I keep saying, is that in order for us to sort our economy out, we have to get ourselves into a growth mindset, because the last six years we have been very inward, very insular uh, looking as a country, and we now need to step up and actually grow this country, and we can do that incredibly positively. We have awesome Kiwi services and products to sell to the world. We sit bank smack in the middle of the Asia-Pacific region, the most dynamic part of the globe, and we have people that are demanding our services. But we have to go out now and hustle and make things happen, and that means every sector across this country needs to do its part and play its role. Uh, as you all know, before the pandemic, uh, international education was New Zealand's fifth largest export earner. It generated almost $4 billion worth of uh, value to the economy, and it employed 6,000 people and by some estimates much higher. And, in some, and as you all know, uh, our country was so slow coming out of the pandemic and we didn't bounce back as quickly as places like Canada and Australia. And so we actually want to see now uh, this sector take off because just last year it generated only $800 million worth of GDP to New Zealand. And while those numbers are picking up, we are well behind where our competitors are. And be under no illusion, I use that word competitors deliberately, think Australia, think Canada who are out there in the world hustling, making the case for why students should be coming to their countries. We see Canada pretty much where they were pre-COVID, Australia pretty close to it, and if you look at the numbers that we've seen in New Zealand, we're less than halfway where we were uh, before COVID came along. So it is critical that we get our sectors growing. Uh, we have to get ourselves externally oriented. We have to get ourselves focused on going out in the world with some positivity, some confidence, some ambition, and some aspiration. Let's leave the negativity and the inwardness and the insularity behind and let's go out there and make a great future for ourselves. And part of that is firing up every sector we have in this economy to earn more so we grow our economy, so we can invest in infrastructure, we can invest it back in enhancing our public services like education and health. Uh, with that, it's also vital that our tertiary institutions can actually turn back on international students uh, so that they can actually get supported through that process as well. But importantly, we get our, our sector of our economy growing. With that, I just want to uh, hand over to Penny, who will talk us through uh, our plan to actually revive uh, uh, international education, and then on to Erica, and then I'll come back, close it out, and then we'll have a bit of a mix and mingle, and then what we'll do at the end is, uh, we'll have, after that, we'll then go deal with, talk with the media and do a media briefing after that. Uh, Penny. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher, and it's wonderful to have you here in Southland, and particularly fabulous to have you here at SIT. Awesome. And it's great to be in amongst colleagues and friends from SIT. So the revenue raised from higher international fees supports New Zealand's universities, our polytechnics and other tertiary institutions to provide better quality education and services for all our students while keeping costs down for our domestic students. It helps great institutions like our wonderful SIT deliver the sort of world-class education that drives growth and opportunity both here in Southland and in the rest of the country. International education, as you know, also strengthens our connections with the rest of the world, which makes it easier for New Zealanders to succeed on the global stage, exposing our young people to new ideas and perspectives and creating international networks that can drive future economic growth and opportunity back home. So it's absolutely vital we get international education back on its feet. Other countries have got the jump on us recently, post-COVID. They've adjusted their immigration settings to attract international students while we are struggling to keep up. We need to take action to encourage students to choose New Zealand as their preferred place to study. I'm really pleased now to ask my good friend and colleague Erica to talk about the specific changes to immigration that will help revive, revive international education in New Zealand. Thanks, Erica. Kia ora, good morning everyone. Thank you Penny and Christopher. Uh, National has said that we will make immigration meet New Zealand's needs. And as Penny and Christopher have outlined, there is a need to revive international education mm -hmm. as part of lifting economic growth in New Zealand. 
This is a very competitive sector, uh, as Christopher and Penny alluded to, and New Zealand needs faster processing for our student visas because academic courses have fixed dates and students need certainty. And we need a more competitive offering when it comes to work rights for students, but also for their partners. We can also be smarter about how we lift the education sector. So our policy has a particular focus on attracting students who we want to study in areas where New Zealand has particular skills shortages. That's because it's far better to fill those shortages with someone who has lived here, who's studied in New Zealand already, rather than bringing in workers from overseas who don't have that same connection to this country. Mm. So our plan has four points, which are one, fast tracking visa processing for international students who pay an additional fee. Uh, two, increasing from 20 to 24 the number of hours international students are able to work each week. And now that very much brings us in line with Australia. When Christopher talked about being competitive, that's what we're talking about here, making sure that students choose New Zealand because they have the same work rights as they do in Australia. Three, expanding work rights for international students and their partners. Uh, for example, we would give partners of students studying degree level seven qualification and above open work rights while their partner is studying, returning to what we used to do. As part of expanding work rights, we would also ensure international students who have studied in New Zealand in areas where we have skills shortages have a pathway to residence. If they're here and they're studying in an area where we need them to be, we would love them to be able to stay and work uh, in that area. Four, we will diversify the countries from which Education New Zealand recruits. A recent report said New Zealand was in the bottom three nations for the diversity of our international student population, with 80% of students coming from just nine countries in 2022. So that's a, a quick summary of our proposed changes, which we believe will make New Zealand a more attractive destination for international students and be part of reviving the sector here and contributing to economic growth, which is good for all of us. Awesome. Well, listen, can I just um, say thank, thank you to Penny, thank you to Erica. Um, um, I hope you got a sense of it. You know, we have a great country here in New Zealand. We have so much potential. We have incredible people. We sit in a dynamic part of the region and we have a great so set of social institutions here that puts fairness at the heart of everything we do. Uh, but we are not realising that potential. We are not solving our problems and we are not maximising the opportunities that are in front of us. We have a great opportunity here to actually revive our international student sector, to make sure that we can get really great connections to the world, get those people-to-people -people connections flowing, to create opportunities uh, in our own economy, to actually get it growing again, uh, and we're really excited about that. So um, with that, um, let's break. We'll get a chance to catch up with a few of you, uh, and then we'll take our questions from the media uh, separately after we've done that. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Appreciate it. What's happened? Uh, and as you can see, you know, what we've talked about today is our plan to revive uh, international students in New Zealand uh, in the context of our economy uh, with low growth it's really important that we actually get the, the country growing again. With that, have you take the questions? Visa processing times at the moment are 44 weekdays, that's 62 days overall. If you want to reduce that down to 14 days, yep. how on earth are you going to do that? Well look, I mean we've actually seen a big slowdown of visa processing times even before COVID from Immigration New Zealand. What we're saying here is that we also will have priority visa processing and that will be up to Immigration New Zealand to set that rate to recover their costs fully to be able to process. Uh, and actually we see uh, MB for example as a big government agency, it's added two and a half thousand staff, it's had an extra $500 million worth of uh, uh, budget added to it and what we really want Immigration New Zealand for is to deliver outcomes for New Zealand and actually we'll protect those frontline services, get these visas processed and get these get these young students here. Who's going to process the visas though if you're gutting the backroom staff? Uh, what we're doing is we're making sure we can deliver frontline services uh, but we want every resource focused on delivering outcomes and as a result as I keep saying in Immigration New Zealand's case it's about speeding up visa processing making sure that they are actually delivering for us in New Zealand, doing the audits they need to be doing on accredited workers, uh, employers, uh, and making sure we get that job done. We can make sure that we move communication staff out of back office functions, uh, we can make sure that's forward deployed into frontline services. We will protect frontline services, but what I am not here to protect is bureaucracy, and we have seen an 80% growth in government spending, we have seen a huge addition, 14,000 more public servants added into Wellington, and actually we're getting worse outcomes. So I want everybody focused on outcomes. I want everybody going to work at Immigration New Zealand today, understanding what they're there to do, 
I don't want distractions, I don't want bureaucracy, I don't need people wasting time on projects that we're not supporting going forward. They don't even have enough staff at the moment to do enough audits on the migrant workers. Okay, I'll let Erica talk to that, but I'm very confident because I'm telling you, when you add 14,000 public servants, almost $2 billion on consultants and contractors, and you deliver worse outcomes in terms of processing speed and times, that's a poor outcome. Thank you. Look, what we have said here is that if international students need their uh, visa processed in a, a, a very short time frame, that they will be able to pay an additional fee mm. for that. So we'll be collecting uh, fees in order to help uh, fund that. But what I would also say is we've got an announcement coming in the next few weeks, uh, our immigration uh, manifesto announcement, where we will talk about how we're going to speed up visa processing using some pretty innovative uh, new ways to support immigration New Zealand. So we'll have more to say about that in the how future. How much are those fees? How much are the yeah, fees? The fees? Um, well, actually, in terms of the actual visa processing for student visas, that'll be set by Immigration New Zealand to make sure they fully recover their costs. As we talked about um, with, our, with our tax plan, we're actually were also going to introduce accelerated fees as well for immigration. And again, in that case, we've said, look, let's peg our fees at about 90% of what Australians charge, that actually new migrants coming to New Zealand can pay fees, user fees need to be recovering the cost of immigration in New Zealand uh, and we'll cap that at about 90% of what, what it is in Australia. So it's competitive but actually we are making sure that there is cost recovery happening as where a result. Does, where does the money go as well? Does it go back into just supporting immigration New Zealand or does it go to, to pay for another policy? Yes, are it goes using, back into supporting immigration. No, we, 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 as we talked about with respect to our tax plan, we want immigration New Zealand to be able to recover its costs uh, by actually being able to fast track processing of visas. Uh, and as a consequence, what that means is they will set prices that recover costs but are also capped at about 90% of what Australia charges for the equivalent visas, so we stay competitive. Uh, but that's really important. Do you have anything else to say about user fees? User? No, I think that, I mean, the boss has covered it all. But look, what I would say was, this, there is a, when you look back at 2017, we were processing uh, student mm. visas much faster than we are now. Pre COVID. All, all we're saying is if, if also students have an emergency case where they need to have their visa processed in a much shorter time frame, we'll allow them to do that by paying a fee. But also, we want to be able to bring uh, the visa, regular visa processing down as well to what it was when we were last in government. Why do they take so long? That's a, that's yeah. a question for Andrew Little. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you're elected, what time frame would you see as implementing these changes? Um, as quickly as possible. I mean, we are in a situation where Canada has already bounced back to its number of international students uh, pre-COVID. Australia is pretty much there already, and our numbers have us probably at about half of where we were, once were. And so our challenge is that we've been too slow out of the gate. Uh, our competitors have got to jump on us. Uh, they've also been, frankly, um, pushing the proposition for international education in their countries to a much broader set of markets as well. And that's why you know, our fourth point is we actually want Education New Zealand to get out and about and actually broaden the source of international students to New Zealand as well. Yeah, what countries are you looking at? Today? Sorry. If GDP figures to say the country is no longer in a recession as expected, does, doesn't that take some of the heat out of your argument that Labor's dismantled the economy? Uh, I just say to you, we have low and anemic growth going on in this country. And when you look at the forecasts that we saw uh, from Prefu, uh, that is not something for us to be proud about. I think it is likely that there'll be sort of slow, uh, very, very anemic, slow positive growth for the second quarter, the June quarter. You're already hearing the Reserve Bank of New Zealand saying the third quarter, which is the September quarter, is probably a negative growth again. Uh, and there's always talk of a double dip recession. Uh, what I'm focused on is either way you look at it, what we're seeing is slow, low, anemic growth for New Zealand for a long, for, for a bit of a, a while. Uh, and that's something that we've got to stop. And as a result, we have to rediscover how to grow this economy. And you cannot sit here, you know, waking up each and every day, not maximising opportunities that are in front of us, like international student education. Uh, and that's why we've got to turbocharge it and get it revived. Yeah, how many extra international students might come as a result of the Yeah, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, well, we had 55,000 before the before COVID, so we really should be aiming to get back to at least pre-COVID um, figures. And uh, we really, you know, we should be able to do that. We should be able to expand on that even. 
Yeah. Can I just ask about um, a thing here about where you're recruiting them from? You said that Education New Zealand's been focusing on Asian countries. Yeah. What countries do you want the students to go to? Yeah. Yeah. Look, that's something we'll work through with Education New Zealand because they are doing all the market research. We also need to look at where our competitors are. So uh, it is important though, we've got one of the lowest diversity, only nine countries that we source most of our students from. Mm. So we really need to be looking at the economies that are growing fast. But that's a conversation I would be having with Education New Zealand in terms of looking at their marketing market research. And I can hear the political parties now calling this a dog whistle saying, the National Party doesn't want more Asian students. Oh, is it a no, no, no it's not at all. No, no, it's and. As, as Christopher said, it's an and. Uh, we just want to grow up the markets as well as. Are you comfortable with the level of record migration that we have at the moment? Or yeah, is it, I'll, I'll talk to that. Yeah. Obviously that brings a lot of skills, but it also puts a lot of pressure on infrastructure housing. And things of course. Like that. What we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, during the lockdowns, we saw a number of, of, of migrants leave the country, uh, uh, quite a large number, and with our borders closed we were allowed or were able to bring those workers back. So we have had a period uh, of significant immigration of workers, catch which up. we absolutely needed. It was a catch-up. Uh, and you are now seeing those numbers very much sharply decline. Two months ago we had 15,000 workers a month coming in. We're down to five now, so you can see it starting to tail out. Uh, as we sort of rebalance. But what we're here today to talk about is international students. Now we used to have about 60,000 in the country. They were filling jobs during, uh, you know, during their 20 hours they had a week to work, like uh, working at McDonald's as fast food chefs, working as security guards, working uh, in, in the supermarkets. We are now having to bring in people on work visas for three to five years doing those jobs. What we really want to do is maximise our international students so they can be filling those roles like, roles like they used to, so that we don't have to rely on so many uh, workers coming in to do those roles. So it really is a bit of a switch rather than a, an increase in one area adding to an increase. So and the, actual, the actual level, though, that we're seeing, the near record level, that's a level that you're comfortable with? It's a, it's a record, it's a level that I'm comfortable with because of the conditions we had. I don't see that that number mm. will continue. We see it already dropping off. Uh, and I, mm. I, I think, it, you know, both the Minister and I both agree because we've both looked at the statistics. We can see it tailing off. It will rebalance. It's not going to remain at the levels we've seen because that was a catch up. And where do you want it to rebalance to? I do. Well, look, I mean, what I'd say is no, no politician and no leader of any government is going to be able to give you a number. Uh, what's important is that it actually matches what we need in the economy. And Eric is exactly right. We're going through a period of catch-up. We're seeing a slowdown of that now as we get through that bubble of, of, of talent that we've needed to bring into the country. Uh, and importantly, we're also seeing an economic slowdown. So the market actually will be bringing that, those numbers down. Uh, but again, what's important is that we actually make sure that we actually get the, the skilled workers that we need here in this country to get a, a, make sure immigration is always linked to our economic agenda. 39% of voters now the economy. Would you have expected that number to be higher? Uh, well, I think that's what this economy, this election's all coming down to, as I keep saying, and that's my, my opening remarks today, is that it is all about who is best placed to run this economy. And, as you, and, I, and, and National has the plan to be able to move this country forward, which is to tackle inflation so that we can get interest rates down, we can get economic growth back into the country again. Uh, and when we do that, we grow our economy, it enables us to invest in our public services and also our infrastructure. And so uh, that is what this election is all about. Who do you think are the better economic managers? And I just put it to you, you know, Labour have had an absolute majority for the last three years and they have been useless. They cannot deliver anything. And as a result, if the choice is, if you want to throw the Party Māori, the Greens and Labour into all of that mix, I can tell you the next three years will be disastrous for New Zealand. So the choice is pretty stark. Strong, stable, national-led government that can fix the economy, or a coalition of chaos with more drifting and going backwards. How, how would that be any less than a national act? Well, as I've said before, you know, I think New Zealanders are understanding very clearly that there's a lot at stake at this election. And that's why I keep saying, and MMP elections, let's be clear, under, under our system are very, very close. And that's why you need to party vote national. That's what I've been consistent with my message for. If you want a guaranteed change of government, most New Zealanders understand the country's going in the wrong direction. Party vote national. Uh, and that's important. Why, why, why won't Labour be able to bring in their policy of Sorry? Why won't Labour be able to bring in their policy of GST free fruit and veg by the first of April? Well, I mean, again, uh, the, the bigger issue is it's just a bad policy, right? I mean, to get, as I keep saying, a couple of cents off some beans and carrots, uh, that's not going to get passed through to the consumer or the customer. 
you know, officials, economists, everyone's advised against the fact that that's actually not a good policy. Michael Cullen, an expert tax working group that the government put together, said it's a bad idea. You know, Grant Robertson thought it was a bad idea until fairly recently as well. And it is a bad idea. You know, it doesn't work because... Yeah, other than that, though, can they bring it in by the 1st of April? Oh, I think it would be incredibly difficult to do that. That is a massive amount of complexity and change for retailers up and down the country to get everything organised and ready to go for the 1st of April. But the bigger point is it's just a dumb policy, right? It's not the way in which you actually support uh, low and middle income New Zealanders. Our plan is the better plan. We care about working people. Labour and the CTU used to purport to do that. They don't do that anymore. They don't care about it. Will yeah. national commits are rebuilding Hospital? Uh, yes, and again, this is outrageous. You know, I saw Hipkins this morning rock up to a Meet the Candidates meeting in uh, Hawke's Bay, uh, partly because uh, Labour's in massive trouble in Hawke's Bay, announced 11 days out from early voting that he's going to uh, invest in the Hawke's Bay Hospital after having had six years of not doing so. In 2020, we came out and committed very strongly to uh, upgrading the hospital. We can, that, that commitment remains in 2023. I just put it to you again, you know, this is a government that cannot deliver a pizza. I mean, honestly, they're that hopeless. Uh, in 2017, they said they'd upgrade Dunedin Hospital. What has happened? Construction hasn't even started in Dunedin six years later, and actually the scope of that hospital has gone backwards. This is, this, is the same, this is the same government that said it would build Kiwi building houses and done 1.8% of what it promised. This is a party that said it would have light rail in place, hasn't built a metre of track. So no disrespect, these guys cannot deliver anything, even with the absolute majority they had the last three years, they'll be more hopeless under a coalition of chaos. Sorry. Um, Chris I'll you. Uh, we'll be releasing ours in the next week. And how significantly have you had to rejig your plans uh, due to the state of the economy and of the books? Well, as, as we've been very prudent and economically responsible with all of our policy announcements. If you think about our family boost policy, it's our way to get money directly to families with young children who've got high early childhood education costs. We're doing it straight into their bank account. How do we fund it? From, from, from knocking off $400 million worth of consultant spent. Uh, you know, and the same thing's happened on our tax plan. Our tax plan is delivering income tax relief to working New Zealanders, and we're doing that through reprioritising savings and raising new revenues. And so we have been very constructive and thoughtful about uh, how we actually fund our policies. Uh, but as I said, our tax plan stands alone from our fiscal plan, and we'll detail that shortly. How would you describe your personal level of trustworthiness? Pretty trustworthy or super trustworthy? Super trustworthy. <laughs> Uh, the New Zealand people can trust me that I came to, the, to this job two and a half years ago uh, into political life because I want this country to be better than this. There is so much potential in this great country of ours. We have such a great future ahead of us, but we are not realising that potential. We are not solving our problems and we are not maximising opportunities. And that's why I came here, because I solve problems, I get things done, I build great teams, and we need to go to work and have a great future. How will you manage David Seymour and Winston Peters? They're not very fond of each other. Are you going to be able to manage? Well, as I've said to you, uh, if you want to change this government, a guaranteed change of government, you need to party vote for national. Um, and we will work with the outcomes that the New Zealand people give us on election night. As I said, I'm very confident that David Seymour and I and the National Act uh, Government would be able to work incredibly well together. We know each other well, we've worked well in the past, um, we have alignment on, on some of the ends around economics and um, education and other things. Uh, the way we deliver it will be different, but we'll work our way through it. When's the last time you with, um, yeah, you talked to David Seymour a lot and you guys have a good relationship with Yeah, we've been neighbours for four years, so when's we know each other well. When's the last time you communicated with Mr Peter? Oh, it would have been months ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I would have run into him in some event. Yeah. If there's no, if there's no jobs left um, in the school shortage area, what do they do, the international students and their partners? Uh, well, look, I think we've got a long way to go before we get to that problem. Uh, what we have is a situation, and, you know, and that's what Erica and Penny have been talking about, is to say, how do we make that more dynamic? You know, we, we had a perverse conversation last year. You know, last year we said we were 4,500 nurses short, and we spent the whole year arguing with this government about why nurses couldn't be added to the green list. We went a whole year about that. I mean, that is insane. We either have a problem in this country and we're solving problems, or we just keep talking about stuff. And so the talk is finished, we need to get into action mode, and what we want is a more dynamic read of actually where are the worker shortages, and actually let's accelerate those roles uh, and those professions uh, into fast tracking and getting them here as international students and making, making and solving our worker shortages. Can I just get okay. a quick reaction? Chris Hickens said yesterday that you were talking to members with contempt for not releasing the model and behind the What's your reaction? Well, look, I don't take lectures from Chris Hipkins. I mean, he has single-handedly, him and Grant Robertson, run this economy into the ground and actually caused huge pain and suffering for New Zealanders. So oh, his, he's out of touch, he's out of ideas, and he's out of time. Are you treating New Zealanders? 
absolutely not. You know, we've been incredibly um, straight up about how we actually fund our tax plan. Uh, I think, you know, actually if you're Chris Hipkins, the Labor Party or the CTU should come out and support it. Uh, because what we're doing is essentially saying we're going to adjust uh, tax thresholds for inflation, we're going to use um, tax credits, whether it's working for family, or the IETC, uh, and our family boost way. Uh, all of that is good, sensible, pragmatic, common sense solutions to help people. In, okay. in light of today's Justice. announcement, um, do you have a message for Tate Pekinga in terms of their indicated job losses? Um, again, what I'd say to you is that has been an unmitigated disaster. It's classic Chris Hipkins, Minister for five and a half years, grandiose project, uh, massive centralisation and control, $100 million deficit, enrolments are down across the system, and what we have lost is an ability for what we saw here in Invercargill. SIT was very, very connected into the workforce needs of this region and actually designed its programs to support the economic development of this region. And we have lost that with centralisation and control. We are a party that believes in more localism and devolution. We think we want to see local partners and actors in our society working together to actually grow their regions and actually serve their people better. So okay. Okay. Just wanting to ask whether you believe that Labor has any connection to this tour and also can Labor really stop Harry Tam from travelling around and... Yeah, Labor, Labor should be not soft on crime. Labor should care about the victims of crime, not the offenders. But Labor the should stop backing and supporting gangs. You don't give gang members $2.7 million to run a drug rehab program. There are infinitely better rehab uh, facilities and people around the country that deserve that money. Uh, gangs want the, re the rights of being Kiwis, they're not up for taking the responsibilities. And so uh, they peddle in misery, cause huge pain and suffering. And those programs work? Uh, I support programs that work, but I am not supporting gangs who put people up onto drugs and then say, we've got a rehab program that helps. It doesn't work. We've got much better providers like Salvation Army and other programs across the country. Okay, so I've got to go on and uh, do the next activity. Um, thank you very much. For